Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a program on constitutional government, and our speaker today is Barton Swaim. Barton Swaim is a writer from Southern Carolina. That's how we treat the South up here. And, um, but he's a writer. And uh, he was a speechwriter, and he wrote a book called The Speechwriter, which I highly recommend. He was a speechwriter for Governor Mark Sanford of, of uh, correctly named South Carolina. And uh, the subtitle of this book is A Brief Education in Politics. So uh, it, it, it is, in the first place, a study of uh, how to deal with a difficult boss, right? And, but but also uh, the, the special difficulties that arise from his being uh, in politics as a, as a governor. He actually attended the University of South Carolina, and then went to the University of Edinburgh, and, uh, and then it was from 2007 to 2010 that he worked for. Mark Sanford. He also writes regularly for the Wall Street Journal, Times Literary Supplement, and the Washington Post. Let's add the Weekly Standard. So Barton Swain. Oh, his title is Donald Trump and the War on Expertise. Um, I uh, thank you. I wasn't I wasn't sure what the format would be, so. Um, I wrote out my talk also on the grounds that um, if I was going to offer up a partial defense of Donald Trump. Can you start the microphone? Oh, sorry, sir. Thank you. Um, I thought if I was going to um, offer up a, a partial defense of Donald Trump at, at Harvard, then I should probably write out my speech because I didn't trust myself to just go impromptu. Um, it's careful, carefully worded, um, but so I'm, I'm going to sort of semi-read it, if, if that's okay. Um, and, then, and then we'll do a, a more natural discussion afterwards. <clears throat> my father is an option trader. He's made pretty good money, his term, over the last few years. Although he was a stockbroker for a brief time in the 1960s and early 1970s, he didn't actually work in that field for nearly a half century. He trades options from his home office in South Carolina. Dad doesn't think highly of most analysts and pundits on the subjects of stocks and options. When his granddaughter, my niece, brought home a book on option trading and suggested to him that she would like to learn more about the subject, he was pleased by her interest, but unimpressed by the book. Throw it in the trash, he told her. It's worthless. Dad left the brokerage firm he worked for in 1973 and went to work for his father in the hotel business. He thrived in that line of work, and after my grandfather died in 1982, ran an oceanfront hotel until 95. Somehow he did this without ever having attained a degree in hotel management or hospitality tourism, as you can now do at many state universities. It should not have surprised me then that he supported Donald Trump almost from the moment Trump announced his candidacy. We argued about it. I still hold on to the idea that I was right and he was wrong, but I am a little less sure than I was. Much has been said and written about Trump's victory as a revolt against the elites. Certainly, it is that. But so, in a sense, is every Republican presidential campaign that's victorious. The red versus the blue, the rednecks versus the metropoles. Trump's victory was also, and maybe was primarily, a revolt against the professionalization of American life, a revolt against the credentialism and preoccupation with expertise that marks our politics, our news media, and especially our education systems. 
you could probably chart the rise of professionalization by, a, by charting the steady expansion of the word profession. At one time, there were, of course, only three professions, law, medicine, and the church. The word profession signified the solemn declaration or promise that you made in order to practice in these fields. Now the term is almost synonymous with livelihood or even job. So everybody is a professional, an expert at whatever they happen to do from 8.30 to 5 on weekdays. And if you're a professional, you need a license. Hence the constant metastasizing of licensure in most states' regulatory codes. In my state of South Carolina, for instance, there uh, now are quiet efforts, and they will almost certainly be successful, to require a license for the practice of music therapy and a license for locksmithing. And for decades, you've needed a license legally to earn income by braiding hair. I, I realize that the debate over licensure is a, is a complicated one, um, but I mention it just to point out that there is a special kind of mindset that generates the belief that you need a license to braid someone's hair, or at least to take money for doing so. And then, of course, there are the universities, uh, in institutions that turn out credentialed experts or pre-experts in a constantly multiplying array of disciplines and subdisciplines. Many of which, like mine, English Lit, were invented solely for the purpose of training experts to train more experts in order to train yet more experts. There are now a great many Americans who don't have the right credentials, but who know they could do the jobs better than the people who do have the jobs. And a great many also who have the right credentials but can't find a job in their chosen field because the institutions that train them neglected to mention that their field doesn't actually have any jobs. Many of these same people have grown weary of watching highly credentialed experts of all kinds assert major claims about consequential policies, get those claims spectacularly wrong, and return a few months later to assert yet more claims their credibility seemingly undiminished. You're not talking about professors, are you? <laughs> if you're one of these people, I mean, I mean the people who watch the experts, not the experts. If you're one of these people, you might have heard and seen in Donald Trump something that, despite your best efforts, you kind of liked. His rise to power was and is one long chaotic, ferocious outcry against the experts and against the idolatry of expertise. The first stage of the revolt was, of course, his campaign. His was everything campaign professionals would have told him and probably did tell him a winning campaign cannot be. Compared to the consultant-driven campaign of Ted Cruz, for instance, a notoriously disciplined and effective political strategist, Trump had no strategy other than to get in front of as many people as he could and to talk about whatever he wanted to talk about, which was usually something about how the people who've run the United States for a generation were total losers. <laughs> and despite all their smooth talk and prestige, didn't know what they were doing. Unlike the other candidates whose political consultants and campaign managers told them which media to speak to and which to avoid, Trump, especially during the primary, happily spoke to any member of the media who wanted to talk to him, even small websites that you've never heard of. I don't know if any of his consultants told him that that's a terrible idea, but I am certain they thought it. And they were dead wrong because their expertise is fraudulent. Surely there is a book to be written about the many ways in which the Trump campaign, despite all its slapstick laziness 
zaniness, excuse me, and allegedly catastrophic missteps made fools of those who claim to be and who derive a great deal of money by being experts in the art of politics. The experts got it wrong because you can't be an expert in electoral politics. This is an area of human activity in which most of the rules of success are not rules at all because they change from time to time and place to place. What works at one time for one candidate doesn't work in different circumstances. The main requirements for <coughs> success in electoral politics are fortuitous timing, also known as luck, <laughs> some ability to raise money and exploit connections, and a tacit feel for what voters might respond to at any one moment. Trump is not a political genius. He ran for president in 2000, you may remember, and got nowhere. In fact, he knows very little about politics, which was his greatest strength in 2016. There is a revealing detail in a forthcoming book. It's out next week, and I shall review it, um, called Shattered Inside Hillary Clinton's Doomed Campaign by Jonathan Allen and Amy Parnas. Uh, in that book, there's an anecdote that nicely illustrates the folly of professionalizing political campaigns. The author's name, the people who had a hand in Clinton's announcement speech. <coughs> that speech was worked on by Dan Schwerin, Lisa Muscatine, John Favreau, Joel Benenson, Robbie Mook, Lisa Palmieri, John Podesta, Mandy Grunwald, Jake Sullivan, and Christina Shake. The speech was terrible, aimless, pretentious, and boring. Donald Trump's announcement speech, by contrast, wasn't a speech at all. <laughs> he just rambled crudely about how bad things were and how they could be great again, but somehow his speech connected with people and hers did not. <laughs> Since his victory, Trump has mounted a brutal assault on Washington's culture of expertise. He's hired some experts, for sure, but he's also appointed people to <coughs> key positions who, whatever their capabilities, are not from and do not speak the language of the agencies over which they have authority. Think of Department of Education, uh, Housing and Urban Development, even the Department of State. He has done this I assume, deliberately. Many people in and outside of these fields find the whole spectacle appalling, especially the professionals and experts themselves. A recent uh, feature essay in Politico magazine was titled, Trump Takes on the Blob. The blob being a term for Washington's foreign policy professionals who do things their way and only their way and whose traditions a succession of presidents has so far found it impossible to alter. <coughs> Whether Trump will succeed in altering the blob is anybody's guess, but members of the blob certainly feel that they are about to be changed, and they're terrified. <coughs> One of them, a foreign service officer with vast experience, was told by the administration to leave, to the dismay of his colleagues. He delivered a speech at his going away party in which he remarked, as a kind of polite complaint on the way out, that foreign policy professionals should serve the administration if they can on the grounds that, quote, a foreign policy without professionals is by definition an amateur foreign policy. That's a clever remark, but I find its logic oddly circular. Professionalism is good and right because it is not its opposite. But is an endless supply of expertise nearly, all, is it always a good thing? A related question, is foreign policy an area of activity that necessarily improves when its practitioners have more and more experience? Everyone agrees that experience is an area uh, that can be profitable. But in an area as pro protean and prone to interpretation as foreign policy, there are a lot of different and opposing views about what a good foreign policy is. The word 
expertise. Indeed, the concept of expertise seems somehow inapt. Tom Nichols, uh, in a new book titled The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters, takes a very different view from mine. Nichols is a professor of national security affairs at the Naval War College, and he is very exercised about the ways in which ordinary Americans, encouraged by the internet and social media, often think they possess sufficient knowledge to assert strong opinions about complicated subjects in the absence of any knowledge at all. I think we all probably share that concern in one way or another. Not coincidentally, I think, Nichols was and is a pretty fierce critic of Trump. He's a conservative never-Trumper. I was a conservative never-Trumper as well. And then I became a conservative, um, oh hell, I guess, Trumper. <laughs> um, uh, his book, uh, Nichols' book, judging by its Amazon rankings, I checked this morning and it was number 635 which is really good, he's making some money. Um, judging <laughs> by that ranking, he has touched a nerve among the people who are similar, similarly apprehensive about the new administration's attitude. One problem with Nichols' argument, though, is that he fails to distinguish between areas of study and activity that lend themselves naturally to expertise and those that do not. In his introduction, for instance, he rightly explains that the division of labor is what allows our society to produce enormous wealth and complexity and beauty. Here's a passage from the book. While there was once a time when every homesteader lumbered his own trees and built his own house, this not only was inefficient but produced only rudimentary housing. There's a reason we don't do things that way anymore. When we build skyscrapers, we do not expect the metallurgist who knows what goes into a girder, the architect who designs the building, and the glazier who installs the windows to be the same person. That's why we can enjoy the view from 100 floors above a city. Each expert, although possessing some overlapping knowledge, respects the professional abilities of many others and concentrates on doing what he or she knows best, end quote. Surely, though, there is a categorical difference between expertise in glazing and expertise, say, in foreign policy or housing policy. There is a right way and a wrong way to mount a glass panel onto a building. I suppose there are technical aspects of glazing over which glaziers disagree among themselves, but this is not an area in which there's much room for views and interpretations and schools of thought. <coughs> Government policy is closer to a soft science, diffuse and often imprecise, and in need of interpretation and persuasive expression. I don't think glaziers establish magazines around isms or hold conferences with grandiose thematic titles. It makes sense, in other words, to apply the idea of expertise to tasks that require technical knowledge and technical skill. But to call a foreign policy official an, or an academic an expert sounds like an attempt to cut off an argument. There is a peremptoriness about the word expert. If he's an expert, who are we to say he's wrong? And it often fits badly in more abstract conceptual areas of activity that need argument and counterargument in order to flourish. Uh, being a glazing is not, I think, one of those areas. Can you become an expert in business, for example? Um, I feel sort of hung up on this one because um, the state university where I live just built a um, billion dollar <coughs> school of business when they already had a billion dollar school of business. They just built it in a different location and the big building is terrible. Can you become an expert in business? Evidently you can because you can earn expensive undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in it. And yet nobody thinks that having a degree in business makes you a good business person. 
might make you the opposite. It certainly gives you technical knowledge and may enhance your talents and affords you opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have. But to succeed on your own in business requires some mixture of talent and instinct and good timing and maybe not a degree in business. There isn't very much ordinary Americans can do about professionalization, the professionalization of American life. It hasn't been foisted upon us after all. We've generated it and we've encouraged it. <coughs> we send our children to expensive universities, well aware that they might learn nothing, but reasonably happy in the knowledge that they'll at least have credentials. It wouldn't apply here, I'm sure, but it does apply to my local university. We demand licenses for our own fields of work while complaining about the high prices that result from excessive licensure in other fields. And we've stupidly believed the findings of every university-funded study to come along for the simple reason that this is what experts say. Coffee is good for you. Coffee is bad for you. No, it turns out that coffee is good for you. But one thing ordinary Americans can do to protest the culture of expertise <coughs> is put a man in charge of the US government who has never held any position of any kind in government and who has nothing but contempt for experts as a class. It's going to be ugly. Many people will be needlessly hurt in the process and many avoidable mistakes will be made because the administration ignored the experts. But I suspect Trump and his administration will get some things right too precisely because their views weren't circumscribed and burdened by the experts' traditions. Maybe it took a brash demagogic jackass to shake us out of our subservient days and tell us what to do with this expertopoly we've created. As my father might say, throw it in the trash. It's worthless. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you all. That was a, get away yes, there's a certain silence after this charming <laughs> performance. So, <laughs> but here, yeah. So um, the uh, animosity towards experts is sort of in the conservative tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy Wax has written an essay, which is going to be published uh, fairly soon, in which she talks about um, Antonin Scalia's um, distaste for experts. Um, in fact, the whole debate over the living constitution versus the um, dead constitution or the enduring constitution, <laughs> as Scalia phrased it, um, was, okay, if, if you're going to have a living constitution that can constantly be updated, and, and it's the courts who have to do the updating, and they're going to update constantly in many different fields, how can they do that? Well, they call in experts. So one of the key tools for the living constitution is to have all of this uh, expertise from every every aspect of life, you know, and, and the ones that uh, Scalia focused on were the psychologists and the sociologists and the social workers and right. the uh, soft experts, uh, who he thought, why do they know more than a parent? You know, because they would always bring in, you know, and also the courts just systematically think parents are stupid. So whatever they say, we can totally ignore, but if these experts come in and say mm -hmm. and so forth. So, uh, and Amy Wax makes this argument uh, that actually Scalia was doing nothing particularly novel. If you go to Oakshot or um, some of the classic conservative thinkers, um, Hayek, uh, for example, there's a very strong uh, strain of it. Skepticism yeah. of the, of the well, expert. I um, I wrote this. I confess on on the plane, um, or some of it on the plane, and some of it 
stuck in Atlanta airport. It was all in my head, but I just needed to put it down in words fairly soon before I, before I gave it. And um, I brought in my, in my backpack um, a big fat copy of Rationalism and Politics. And I wanted to get a quotation in, but I, it didn't fit quite as easily as I wanted it to, um, given the time constraints. But yes, um, when, when, um, when I, I read Rationalism and Politics, it's Rationalism in Politics, right, not hand. Um, in um, like 2002, as a graduate student, um, I was completely blown away. Um, I never read anything like that. And it wasn't even in my field, and I wasted a lot of time um, sort of reading that and some other books by him. Um, but all, all he, he's sort of in, in, my, in, in the back of my mind any time I deal with a subject like that. Yeah, and it's a shame too, right? Because sociologists have something to say, um, but it's provoked a kind of disdain. Um, the the abuse of expertise has provoked a disdain among people like my dad. Like that that book is probably not worthless, right? It probably has some interesting and useful things for my niece to learn. Um, but he's over time. I think he's um, he's heard and seen. Too, people, too many people say things um, on, on the authority of unearned expertise. And so he's sort of at a stage in life where he can get away with dismissing it. Um, he's only 75, but... Um. Barton, I wanted to ask you about your place for knowledge and wisdom so take this from the example of your father's response to your niece's shiny new book. Isn't there a presumption that your father <clears throat> could have written a better book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question then is, from the unearned right. to the earned wisdom, mm -hmm. so how would you handle that if there were a book worth reading about a given subject. Right. <laughs> no. I, I, guess, I guess what he's, he's picking up there is that so much of, of option trading, which is a subject I know zero about. I don't actually know what an option is. Um, but it sounds like I do when I say it really confidently. Um, I think what he's picking up on is that what he's made money on and achieved success with is 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 tacit in nature. Um, is it um, Polanyi or somebody who has? I don't know if he coined the term tacit knowledge, but it's a knowledge about a subject that you can't communicate to somebody else because you know it in here. And I'm sure that my dad could not communicate it. He's not a great communicator. He's a terrible teacher. Um, his, his, his way of, of explaining something is just to get really frustrated that you don't already know it. Um, and, and so, but I think he is picking up on the fact that there are, he's, he has a sense of, of the field and how to, how to do it that just can't be put down in, into an article or a book. And I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's partly true. Um, you know, I don't know. If I could just follow up, I understand what, yeah. what you're saying in response to my question about your, your father in the book. But aren't there things that we might wish that Trump personally simply knew or had studied or reflected upon without making him a boring technocrat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and that's why I think it's, it's, um, it's going to be ugly. But, um, you know, there's somebody who's, you know, I, I go through this with, as a, as a parent, um, I tend to be on the more analytical, thoughtful side. And my wife keeps telling me, sometimes you just need to be a jackass. Um, and it's true, um, because 
and I've learned that a few times when I, I don't like to be a jackass actually, but when I have been one, sometimes it's actually kind of helpful. Um, and it has, it has a, the effect of, of rattling my daughters, or the one daughter in particular, um, a, out of a sense of complacence um, where, where that my reasoning and thoughtfulness and allusion to books and everything, that could never work. Um, but if if I'm just a jerk, then it upsets her, and then and then we're able to have this sort of renewed discussion. Um, maybe that's a good metaphor for what's happening. I don't know. I hope it's as uh, innocuous as that. Um, yeah, I say I'm somewhat with you on the, my, the history of my Trumpism, uh, but uh, which is very limited. But what bothers me about Trump is not his lack of expertise, but his lack of education, mm -hmm. and not knowing what average educated people ought to know about the U.S. government and history and <clears throat> well, the world and things like that. And it strikes me that. One should distinguish between expertise, expert knowledge, which is often fraudulent and is usually trying to get someone to adopt a course of action, which uh, you have a better chance of flipping a coin and deciding, you know, to study that. Given what the expert said, for example, about uh, Obamacare and things like that. But, and then there are specialists and people who have specialized knowledge, which is different from expert knowledge. And then there's general education, people who have uh, what the old British uh, colonial administrators had, which was a classical education. Uh, they were very good at Greek irregular verbs, and somehow that translated into de decency in administration, very frequent, not always, but very frequently. Uh, but the Greek irregular verbs, of course, is, is a, is a, is a, is a what they actually did was they read classical literature and history and philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they had a general view of the world. They had mature ideas and they had prudence because they understood that things could go wrong, and uh, that it was very hard to get things right. And they had some kind of also some kind of moral moral formation. It seems to me that's the kind of education we want from our politicians: humane education and not. Expertise, a kind of, uh, pardon my saying, the sort of uh, uh, a political science. I don't say political. We went political philosophy, not political science. Maybe that's why, one way one, one could put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I completely agree, and um, I'm, I'm not really a a. Um, I, I am not a Trump enthusiast at all, but um, in in. You know when the when the um, yes when the election happened, my thought was, for one thing, I couldn't stop laughing. I don't know why. Um, I just it was, you know, it was like you had convinced um, some uh, undergraduate to do something really ridiculous, yeah. and and he actually did it, and you couldn't believe it, and you were laughing. Um, but. When that happened, my thought was, well, okay, this is reality and, and not and not my druthers anymore. But the the um, American voter, per the Constitution anyway, thought that this would be a good idea. So I, my sort of um, self-imposed task for the past uh, few months has been to try to um, examine the Trump phenomenon and find whatever might be good in the long run in it. And this is sort of part of that. Just follow up. Yeah. My point is that, that a broad view of education is actually gives one certain confidence that the, the person who is in office has, um, I don't mean the humanist education that we have today, which is not humanist in my view, but the humanist educate, traditional humanist education gives the so some sense that the person in office has got a, a worldview, a way of thinking that's in, in, informed by the past, knows our traditions, knows, uh, has some kind of basic moral orientation. And this is actually something I think was, is important about Trump. He doesn't have that, but 
Um, and I'm not seeing it commented, but occasionally he shows heart, right? Occasionally he shows that he cares about people and really cares about people or doesn't. Everyone says, oh, he's an actor, he's been to Hollywood, he's on TV. But, you know, he has these moments. I think we had one the other day with, uh, with the Syrian thing where it's very genuine somehow. I was just upset at what happened. We have to do something. And it's not theorized. It's not in the context of foreign policy you know, the, and that sort of thing. But that, that communicates with people, too. I think that's the side of Trump. I mean, I saw a, a very interesting program with Trump with a black church. I think it was in Detroit. And it was utterly a different Trump from every other Trump that we saw. And I think that communicated with people, mm -hmm. those kind of um, moments, uh, even though he did many, many offensive things. Yep. I said many offensive things uh, during during the election. There were these moments of humanity, and, and, and when it's, it's humanity can communicate. Yep. Um, um, but touching on 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 Trump in this context, um, so, so we have universal suffrage. This is something that I want to deal with at some point, but I don't know how yet. We have universal suffrage, so anybody, basically anybody but felons and children can vote, right? Mm -hmm. um, and soon felons will be able to vote. Um, so if that's the case, then the, the politician who's going to be elected has to be a certain kind of person. It's a different kind of person from, from a, an earlier model, and that person has to um, be able to... Um, gauge m multiple and varying constituencies at all times mm. and also just the nature of being a politician um, in that in that circumstance is is that you tell people that you should vote for me because I am great and I have the capacity to solve all these problems like who would do that um, like who who does that um, well, a politician does, a good one anyway. I mean, he might do it in a way um, that makes you think that he's not doing it, but he is doing that. Um, and and that, that's going to attract a certain kind of, of person that's very different from the kind of person who was attracted to running for office, you know, 100 years ago when you could run for your re-election, presidential re-election campaign by just staying in Ohio and having your vice president run around and give speeches for you. Um, it's a different sort of mindset and character, and I don't know that um, having a humane education would ever overlap with that, with that sort of character. I'm not sure. Ross. Right. There was a, a wonderful comment at the beginning of your talk about the way experts who get it wrong just come back no shame, and, and, and proceed to uh, not just opine, but uh, to dictate, even though the previous advice had been uh, catastrophic, maybe. Right. And, and so I wonder if, in so far as, I mean, you know, your own view of politics, there is a place for expertise, and you, you expect real trouble in a Trump administration if it rejects all expertise. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the question is how to... The, the question, uh, the, the project of re resuscitating a, a reasonable claim for experts depends on, on experts um, uh, coming clean or acknowledging their failures in, in some satisfying way. So when I think of the 2016 election, I think of it as, um, as a response to the, the profound failures of experts on both the right and the left. In the 1990s, uh, neoliberals ruled, and uh, they were experts. Uh, Rubin and, and Clinton and Larry Summers uh, deregulated finance. And the consequence of all their expertise was a uh, global financial um, crash in, in 2008. Um, and in the 2000s, neoconservatives ruled. And, and they, in their expertise, you know, brought us on an errand into the Middle Eastern wilderness. Um, and it was, uh, a, 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 you know, 
would, would they agree with that assessment? And it was a five trillion dollar catastrophe that's redounding to the enduring, possibly permanent detriment of American national security. Now, if they had succeeded on their own terms, and in six days or six weeks, it created a rights respecting regime in Iraq, and that then spawned rights respecting uh, regimes across the Middle East. That would have been success. If the neoliberals succeeded in the 1990s, we'd have 3% growth in the economy, as far as the eye could see. And we'd have a very you know, abundant and successful uh, economy. So both sets of elites have failed. In the 2016 election, um, Hillary Clinton, the Democratic nominee, looked like one of the 1990s neoliberals. She had a nice, warm relationship with Goldman Sachs. And she couldn't differentiate herself from, from her husband and from Rubin and from Summers, and that whole posture toward mm -hmm high finance. And Jeb, who should have had the Republican nomination, I'm still startled he didn't get it, right. couldn't explain why he disagreed or where his brother went wrong right. in Iraq. It, on Jeb's view, George W. did everything perfectly, mm -hmm. which wasn't persuasive. Everyone knew in the, in the population that the neoconservative elites had failed in the, in the Middle East. And it was Trump who said, Iraq is a grotesque failure. I mean, Carly Fiorina's jaw hit the floor when he said that. He's the only Republican to have said that. And, and so I think what the, you know, the, the people in 2016 went for Canada. They went for Bernie, who wasn't a neoliberal, and they went for Trump, who wasn't a neoconservative, mm -hmm. because the elites on the right and left had failed. And, and those elites, as you say, just come right back as if nothing wrong had ever happened and are ready to take over again. Mm -hmm. and, and they never say, oh, we did get something wrong. And, and, and as a result, I think they, they have lost uh, a, a kind of claim to our trust. Yep. So, so I wonder if that's, the, if that's the thing. They need to make sense. They are smart people, and they're decent people, and they are experts. But they need to make sense of their failure in a way that, that satisfies those of us who are kind of entrusting public decision making to them. And they haven't done that. Yeah. What? I have a little bit of sympathy for the ones who got it wrong, because I've written some things you know, a year or two years ago. And they're very small level things, you know, I didn't advocate the invasion of Iraq or anything of that magnitude. But it's a, it's a thing that I, I have now changed my mind on. And I don't really know what to do with it, you know? I mean, maybe, no, maybe everybody will forget. <laughs> um, and it's not like you can, you know, are you obliged just to like take to the opinion pages and say, oh, by the way, I've realized I got something wrong. But, um, but yeah, come clean. I don't know how you do that. Um, the the um, human tendency is never to want to come clean um, or to admit one is wrong. So, but maybe Trump, the whole Trump phenomenon, will somehow over over the course of a decade cure people of of that. Yeah. You remember Edward Woodfight. Yeah. yeah. My most vivid example of that, all in the, up in the run up to the first Iraq war in 91, whatever it was, uh, looked like was saying the U.S. Army is going to be destroyed by the yeah. Iraq. You remember destroyed, that? Destroyed, yeah. And, and he was on TV every night saying it on PBS that the U.S. Army could never defeat the Iraqi army. And then the war started, it was over in 48 hours. And he was on PBS again saying, yes, it's just what I said. The American army could, could destroy any army in the world very quickly. And he, had, he, he, he was completely unfazed by the, by the fact that his predictions was, were entirely wrong. And he had an explanation for why he, what he said was really right. And he had to just go back. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's when I stopped. I think we were mentioning last night um, sports announcers um, who have a certain narrative at the beginning of a game. and they. Yeah they seem to know how this game is going to turn out. And it turns out completely the opposite. Yeah. And by the end of the game, they're speaking as if they always knew that it would turn out that way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just want to question the premise here a little bit, that Trump is as, as, as anti-expert as <clears throat> you make him out to be, if that's your intent. I may have misunderstood you. But um, it seems to me, first of all, if you look at just the campaign, uh, at several points throughout the campaign, you know, he cited experts as supporting his, you know, policy on this or policy on that. Um, I, I, I vividly remember on the national defense issue, um, he didn't even give their arguments. He just said, you know, a list of 25 generals endorsed me. I mean, that's, that's a pure appeal to expertise. Sure. 
Um, so there's that, right? So Trump himself is not totally uh, averse to, to experts when they serve him. As, you know, he's a populist. When they serve him, he loves experts. Yeah. Um, and then also, I mean, I found uh, intriguing your description of kind of this democratization of expertise. So everybody's an expert, and, and you can be experts in more and more things, um, which I, I find to just be true. Um, and, and there is something democratic about that. I mean, the expertise is an aristocratic term, but, but the fact that anybody with two years of experience and a menial job can become an ex-specialist and have a business card to go along with it, um, there's something very open about that and, and maybe something that could appeal to, to populist sentiment too. Um, so I wonder if, if this kind of association of Trump or Trumpism, I should say, with a general thrust against expertise might be a, a little, if not exaggerated, then at least premature. Maybe. I do think that um, his, he, he seems to rely on, happy to rely on expertise in the field of national security. Um, I mean, despite the, the Bannon appointment, um, which didn't go well, um, you know, um, uh, the Secretary of Defense um, and, and the, the National Security Advisor are experts, for sure. Um, but in other fields, you know, um, he and, and a, a, lot of, um, a lot of corporate corporate types are like this. They want to send in somebody in a certain area who doesn't know that much, who isn't weighed down by the details of that area. So you pick Ben Carson for HUD, um, which could be brilliant or could be idiotic, and you don't really know. Um, or, um, you know, one of the other appointments, um, and. You know, you, you have to you have to hire actual attorneys to be your attorneys, um, <laughs> um, and you, the White House medical doctor is, I'm sure, an actual MD. Um, um, so I, it's it's um, you're right. I do think that it's a it's a sort of attitude projected that we are we are in in areas that I choose at any one time. It may be arbitrary. I'm going to be sort of anti-expert, um, just in order to shake things up. So I don't know. I, I may push it too far, um, but to me, I think that it's one thing that appeals to a lot of people that he does seem to disdain experts, whether it's true or not. So much in politics depends on what people think. We've got a lot of questions over here. Why don't we just go down the line? Okay. Okay. Um, well, somebody who's both anti-Trump and anti-expert, I'd like to offer a different framework in which uh, we may understand. What I think you've created is, uh, to, to my understanding, a maybe an incorrect juxtaposition as to what the two tendencies are. Because it seems like, uh, at least I'm better served understanding this in the framework of kind of fact versus value. The opposite of experts is not people who don't know anything about anything. The purpose of experts is people who are interested in maybe great and long-lasting questions that have to do with humanity, mm -hmm. and understanding them and acting according to profound understandings of what these questions are and how they're resolved. Okay. So um, I think that the, if anything is lacking, and I offer this as a, as a possibility, if anything is lacking in the 2016 election, is not obviously there's an abundance of expertise and facts, or at least pseudo facts. It's somebody who held their ground as somebody who, who presented a, a, a wise and prudent view of what the world is. And I think that people reacted to the barrage of expertise uh, maybe by do, do going for what wasn't expertise. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they were, there, was, there was a valid alternative to what I think the, the, the debate really is. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, emphasis on facts and I think throughout the United States, throughout the modern world, a, a lack of values or a lack of understanding what those are, or at least the loss of what those values are. So I just wanted to present that maybe as, a, as what the real issues are, and maybe we end up with Trump because there was nobody on the other side. Right. You know? I think that's, that's fair. But by the way, as a, um, as a businessman, I think Trump made it very clear that he really wasn't interested in the minority of policy because he was just going to hire somebody who was going to be interested. Mm -hmm and was going to be able to make the right calls. And I think that at least th that part of his appeal was that, that you know, there's people who know how the world works, and we're going to get them to work on our behalf, right? Mm -hmm. 
what was lacking was uh, really a sense that he knew uh, how the world worked. Right. And I think that's probably why uh, one can be both anti-Trump and anti-expert. But uh, anyway, that, what, I'd, I'd submit that for your comments. Uh, well, you, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, maybe <laughs> is my comment. <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate you presenting that. Um, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the concept of expertise is, is fluid because when you disdain expertise, you're in a sense saying that you know better than the experts and so you must be an expert, right? Um, so it's, well, maybe you're saying that it, it doesn't matter so much in the sense that yeah. you need somebody to navigate the experts. That's yeah. really what you're saying. Right. Maybe that's what your father's saying. I don't know, I've, I've been a businessman, and I can tell you that you know, at the end of the day, it's all about noise and about not listening to it. Uh -huh. Right? And maybe yeah. that's what your father meant. I yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. He, yeah, and in fact, he's used that word noise. Um, he doesn't think that you should, you should listen to any stock analyst. Stock analyst for him is like almost a curse word, which is weird because he has CNBC blaring in his office all day long. Um, maybe he's, he's going deaf. Um, but yes, that is something for me to think about for sure. Borges was just, you know, Jorge Luis Borges, who some of us have read, used to say that he never read the news because, you know, things worth reading about probably happened twice a decade. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, um, I too greatly enjoyed your talk, uh, which of course raises inevitably more questions than yeah. gives us answers. And so I have an, uh, my own list of things to toss out for your comment. Uh, I think uh, I, oh, it's a, when, when you're talking about noise, of course, with these 3 a.m. tweets and these wild charges. There is no greater source of noise in this administration than the man at the top. But my um, things to run by you. Uh, I wonder if you're aware of the, of the great work of, uh, in, the, in the area of expertise by Philip Tetlock, who has uh, so, been a long time since I've read him, and I, I guess his first book was at least a de decade ago. But he took huge numbers of experts and and tested the accuracy of their predictions, and how frequently it was extremely poor. Uh, maybe one lesson is that uh, this, that a good sign of a true expert is is uh, being very humble about their ability to predict the future. You can be. Um, I think the best experts yeah. have this quality. Uh, Trump certainly, secondly, uh, has great respect for the experts of military people, like Kelly and Mattis and McMaster in his administration, uh, and briefly uh, uh, Flynn. Uh, but the expertise he most seems to respect is the experts of people who have been successful in business, and of course he, he thinks he's an example of the, the category, and he has the widespread uh, belief among business people that, <coughs> that any businessman can be a great political executive, which, I mean, he's the first president with almost, I guess with no real military or political or governing experience. Uh, if you're if you look at most of his cabinet, uh, that's true too. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, we're going to test. I mean, he's presumably the first American president in our history who's who's a test of this notion that uh, uh, just because Joe Sh John Smith is a great business success, he can be a terrific governor. Mm -hmm. Oh. What was the background of Mark Sanford before he uh, became governor? Was was he a, a great business success like? Uh, no. Was it law like Johnny no. Edwards or what? No, I think he I think he inherited some money, and he um, 
he owned and managed some properties. It's so sort of hazy. Yes. What's that? So that would be yes. Um, Inheritance. Yeah. <laughs> he it has some property. He 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 always put on a, his resume that he worked at Goldman Sachs at some point in the or early 90s or, or, or late 80s or something. I think he was maybe an intern there. I, honestly, I, it was all sort of a... Did he meet any future members of the Trump administration there? <laughs> maybe. Um, I mean, what you said about um, an expert should be willing or reluctant to predict the future, I think that gets at something important about the culture of expertise. The reason the experts are so often hired, though, is to tell the future, precisely because the people in charge who have to make important decisions want to deflect a little responsibility, so they hire an expert or a consultant, and the consultant says, if you do this, this will definitely happen. And so the person in charge feels a little better about it and says, well, if it all goes south, then I can sort of say, well, they told me, you know, the experts told me, the experts got it wrong, what was I supposed to do? Um, and the, the, the experts really have to, to, to fight that temptation. That's going to make them popular and, and probably earn them some money or some media attention, but it's a, it's a corrosive and dangerous thing to engage in because you don't Charlie actually Schultz, know. Charlie Schultz, who was at the Brookings Institution and very influential for many years, was a macroeconomist. And he, he said, you can always have a number and you can always have a, a date, but you can't have them in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, well, the problem I have with Trump is not a matter of how much expertise he has. He, he doesn't have a political philosophy. It's in at best. The Iraq war was brought up. He didn't consistently come out against the Iraq war. He made a big thing about it, but there was a tape that was played where he came out and supported the Iraq war. He just ignored that. The Washington Post, I don't subscribe to it in all details, but it has a fact checker. There are more Pinocchios given to Donald Trump than any other candidate in history. All the way, from, including uh, the, <clears throat> the Muslims are demonstrating in support of 9-11 in New Jersey, which has never happened. And as he keeps saying it, <clears throat> He has an uncomfortable relationship with the truth. He can barely put two sentences together, and now they have him reading the teleprompter. So he's crudely inarticulate. <laughs> and in that regard, that's why I was in the A-B to anyone but Trump category, but I could understand why people voted for him over Clinton, because Clinton had two strong things against her. One, she was the poster child of the past 20 years at a time where the zeitgeist was, let's have some change, and she was dislikable. And she campaigned, she kept prattling on about how women should vote for her on the basis of gender. Now, there is a gender gap, always has been. Men proclivity to vote for the Republicans, women for the Democrat. This time it widened. I'm sure men did not take kindly to being told that their sort of their gender is excluded on the basis of sex. So you had both candidates, by the way, ended up underperforming percentage-wise the previous election. Trump underperformed Romney and Clinton underperformed Obama by more, and that's why she lost. But the interesting thing is, it came up a little bit with the, when you talk about the baseball game or the, the football game where the analysts make it sound inevitable. We all do that after the election. Mm -hmm. This election was extraordinarily close. You take Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Each state decided by less than a percentage point. If that had gone one percentage point the other way, there were enough electoral votes there to leave Clinton the White House, and one can only imagine what this seminar would be like if Clinton had gotten elected. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happens in American politics is we can have enormous swings with very, very small leverage in terms of the numbers. And that's what's happened here. Uh, to, to be optimistic about, about uh, Trump and whether he'll turn to people who have some expertise because he doesn't seem to have any, I don't know. I, I have serious doubts about the man because it's just the way he behaved during the course of the campaign. I've seen nothing to be optimistic about. I will say I'm very glad Clinton is not president of the United States, and I, I guess the, 
the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch is, is an example of that. Mm. So there are certain beneficial results, from my point of view, that the Republicans control both all three uh, branches. But it, it seems to me that we try to find some kind of silver lining with Donald Trump at our peril. Mm. Well, on, the, on the question of truth, his, his relationship with truth, um, the, the Washington Post, um, you know, they em employ me, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to be too hard on them. But many of their writers, the um, sergeant, the one who does the, the fact checking and several others, sometimes sound as though um, before Trump came along, our politics was marked by reason and, and a high regard for truth. Um, <laughs> the political language before he came was, was, was brittle, and he just snapped it. Um, and and in, in the campaign, what was maybe kind of refreshing in a perverse sort of way was that if you listened to Hillary Clinton and, and Trump together, he was somebody who would see um, the truth and just roll right over it. And if you called him a liar, he didn't really care. Do you ever notice that? People called him liars and he would say, no, it's true what I said. You know, he didn't say, no, the traditional thing in politics is when, when you're called a liar, you say you got something wrong, you, you back up and you say, no, actually what I said was, um, if, if you read the transcript, you know, if you understand it in context and they sort of take rhetorical scotch tape and start, you know, wrapping up everything, he never did that. He just doesn't care. Whereas Hillary, um, her discourse is not marked by truth so much as a constant attempt not to outright lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, which you, you get a sense, of, you know, you listen to her for a long time and she, she is um, very guarded um, when, she, when she discusses an area that she doesn't want to talk about because it could um, reflect poorly on her, her language becomes very abstract and hedged and she constantly sounds like she's trying not to lie, which, you know, I appreciate that in a way, but it's not very winning or persuasive, and compared to to her, Trump just sounds like, well, if we're going to do this, if we're going to lie, then let's just do it, you know? Um, it's technically known as bullshit. Yeah. There's a, yeah. There's a definition by wow. Harry Frankfurt on that. Um, I just wanted to declare something about what you meant by expertise and the problems with it, specifically with foreign policy. Now, part of the time when you were talking, it sounded like what you were saying, especially with your father, is that your father has like a knack. And that isn't exactly expertise. It isn't something necessarily that can mm -hmm. be explained. It's something gained through experience, or maybe certain people have a kind of nature that permits them to make the correct judgments on the spot mm -hmm. uh, based on their experience and their nature. And then the people that claim I studied these things and I done I've got all the right credentials, <coughs> they pretend like there's like a specific process and specific rules you have to follow, but they right. tend to be frauds. So that's one kind of problem. A different kind of problem, and I think you alluded to it, is that there are some things. So like you could see you could be a mathematician or a geometer, and I would say there are expert geometers uh, because you know you can know the demonstration and it's right or wrong. When it comes to politics, however, um, it's not just that you know politicians or statesmen need to have a kind of knack or prudence, but the the question is about the goals of politics. What and people have fundamental disagreements about the proper rules of politics, and so it, it wasn't clear to me what which which of these problems you were trying to. I mean, maybe you can just say both, I suppose. But what's the what's the What's the biggest problem from experts, and what might Trump help? I guess your argument is Trump might help break their false claims to knowledge. But yeah, I, yeah, I'm interpreting Trump as not that necessarily that he'll 
that that he'll do anything about it, but that the his 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 election, his rise to power, is sort of a a um, a, a symbol or, or a or a manifestation of um, a a general kind of impatience with and revolt against the a, a culture that. Um, applies expertise to areas where it doesn't really fit and where the, the claim to be an expert is used not in order to say, I have experience um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I'm, my counsel might be worth something, but in order to make peremptory claims um, about, you know, whatever policy area they want to talk about. Um, it's a way of saying, I'm right and you're wrong. Um, I mean, does it, is it, am I getting... Yeah, I guess to my, I guess here's why I'm suspicious, especially with foreign policy. So one thing the experts say is if you're going to plan a raid on Yemen, for example, you shouldn't do it over a late night dinner and just decide it very quickly. You should go through a process. Mm -hmm. Now, it's probably wrong to say that if you go through the correct process and you talk to all the people you need to talk to, you'll necessarily come to a right decision. But it does seem reasonable to me to say that mm -hmm. uh, it's probably good to have a process, unless you have some kind of genius in charge that doesn't need such a process. Right. I'm not confident he is such a person. And then, on the other hand, you can also say, on the other parallel track, you can say, uh, people that are foreign policy experts, so-called foreign policy professionals, they pretend that they know what the, prop, the, the proper ends of our foreign policy ought to be, and anybody that disagrees with them is wrong. Um, and it'd be good for them not to have the power they have if you had against them someone that had some kind of, uh, like we were saying, humane or mature sense of what the proper goals are. And yeah. in Trump's case, in both cases, I'm not confident that he can do better than process or do better than uh, groupthink. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, I don't, I, don't, I think we'll he'll be l less, less prone to groupthink, maybe. Yeah. Um, he, he, he um, I, I mean, I, th I, think, I think sometimes he does things simply because he thinks that most people think that he won't do them. Yes. And I, you know, as a I'm a writer, and writers um, are what what makes you a good writer sometimes is because you you said the thing that nobody thought you would say. So I kind of have a, a a perverse appreciation of that, um, and you know it, it. I wrote a little piece on a while back. I think I was the first to do this. Um, Applying Nixon's Madman theory to, to to Trump, and I mean Nixon used it very badly, because he's a calculating person and nobody really believed that he was mad. Um, he was far too coldly calculating about everything, probably about what he ate for breakfast every day. Um, but you know he would have Kissinger tell the North Vietnamese, "I don't know what he's going to do," uh, this kind of thing. Um, I think Trump, um, that's pretty believable. Um, so I, I say that just to say that I don't think that he'll be prone to too much groupthink. Um, but the, the preparedness thing I do worry about. I think he would invade Yemen without preparing. Yes. So there's been some allusions to this, uh, but I'd like to ask it directly. Right? Expertise and experience. And for those who like the Latin, not Greek verbs, if I'm not mistaken, it's right, experio, active participle gets you experience, and passive participle gets you expertise, or expert. Uh, so, you know, expertise in a way, it's something that you've uh, learned and it's just there, it's stuck. You know, experience is something that's always uh, evolving and responding to uh, new developments and that's acquired over time. And I think traditionally the public did look for uh, experience, certainly at the 
presidential level, if you look at who ran and then who was elected, it was either generals, senators, or governors, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, from the very beginning, I thought that Trump's, you know, lack of experience, and we know that, uh, you know, your father's experience in business will help him with stock options. It won't help him in politics. I mean, Trump had the same kind of problem, especially the kind of a uh, reckless business that he does. Uh, so, you know, I was shocked by the, the public just not caring about that. Um, traditional societies often think that old men should rule. Um, but, you know, the, the public did seem to think that, at least the Trump supporters, you know, that uh, audacity and, uh, and daring and so on was uh, a substitute not just for expertise but for uh, experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was George Will who wrote a book a long time ago advocating term limits. Um, and in the book, he um, he made the analogy to the Baltimore Orioles, who I think he had some business dealings with or sat on their board or something. And he, um, they, the board or whatever, arrived at the conclusion that their team had a lot of experience and they were really expensive and they were really bad. And so why not fire all the old guys that were so expensive, hire some cheap new guys, and what's the worst that could happen? We'll still be bad. Um, so it's, I think something like that thinking was in the electorate. I mean, what's, what's the worst that can happen? Look how bad experience is. Although, I mean, Bill was saying last night, is, is it really that bad? Um, people, I think, typically in Washington, wonder if it's really that bad because um, the, um, the, the economy of Washington has a sort of a, a built-in um, padding. Um, the unemployment rate is always, you know, two or three percent better in Washington for obvious reasons. Um, but outside Washington, yeah, people didn't think it was bad. Uh, and they were willing just to take a, take a, take a risk. Let me ask about um, the relation between expertise and partisanship. It, mm. it, it seemed, um, is it the case, or it seems to be the case that uh, that uh, expertise is more on the side of the liberals than mm -hmm. of the conservatives? Because what is an expert? An expert is somebody uh, who will show you how to make it better. They're, that's the end of their goal of their, uh, of their expertise. And yet, uh, of course, there are conservative experts. Um, if expertise is science, then it should be impartial. And there shouldn't be conservative and progressive economists, right. for example, if economics is really a science. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there are. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask about that and then about the other the other part would be about whether uh, expertise is uh, intrinsically partial towards uh, liberalism or progressive progressivism, progress. Yeah. yeah. I, not, I note also, by the way, that uh, that another writer, Andrew Ferguson, has been writing about yeah. social so, science so, yes. uh, recently. Social science, right? Something in this in yeah. this, in this same um, vein of, right. of thought. Well, the, the, um, the idea that society can be and should be governed by a class of, of technocratic, um, gifted people um, is, is, is a progressive one rather than a conservative one, for sure. And that the expertise is, is, uh, is, is all wrapped up in that. Um, so absolutely, that's, I think that's true. And I, I think, um, I think Yuval Levine in his latest book, Fractured Republic, deals with that some as well. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a, I'm trying to make a conservative argument here, 
based on, I, I was going to call this an Oakshadian defense of Trump, <coughs> just to be perverse, but um, it's, there is something about ex, expertise wrongly applied that seems to me intrinsically um, progressive, um, and so I, I tend not to like it. And what was the other part of your question? Partisanship. Yeah, just why are there, well, there are also conservative yeah. experts. Right, right, right. But, and, and that's, this is what bothers me. How can, how can, how can you be an expert in a field where <clears throat> the people who are in that field profoundly disagree with each other? What good is the concept of expertise then at all? Um, and that's what I say, glaciers don't disagree with each other. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I actually looked this up on the internet to see if I was wrong. Um, do glaciers have conferences in which they debate? Um, but uh, economists do. Economists hate each other. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. So, so uh, expertise, uh, well, could you, could you say the, that your distrust of expertise is also a distrust of science? Uh, science claims to be all the knowledge that there is, but there must, uh, yeah. at the very least, be uh, a science of distrusting science. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and right. what is it that's, uh, right. that we're missing? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yes, I think that's right. Right. Alberto. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, regarding lying in politics, you seem to like Trump more than Hillary Clinton <coughs> because he was, and he is perhaps, still he is more straightforward <coughs> in lying. Whereas, uh, as I understood you, Hillary Clinton was just more hypocritical, kind of hypocritical, and you mm -hmm. didn't appreciate that. And then you reiterate the fact that uh, you are trying to make a conservative argument here. Um, so my question is uh, whether you, you think that perhaps precisely from that point of view some uh, hypocrisy is needed. So that, that precisely from the hypo um, conservative point of view, hypocrisy can be good or, or not that bad. And so. Uh, I would like you to say something more about this appreciation of uh, Trump uh, precisely in the, uh, those uh, stances of his like um, challenging the distinction between truth and untruth, yeah. trying to introduce concepts uh, like alternative facts, mm -hmm. or trying to describe everything which is disturbing like fake news and so on and so forth. So yeah. it seems to be that that is dangerous from the democratic point of view in general, but more than that from the, even more than that from the conservative point of view, that would yeah. be seen as a, as a danger, as a threat. Right. Is it, is it more dangerous, though, than what we were doing already, which was um, a, a kind of I, I, instead of hypocrisy, um, maybe it's hypocrisy too, but I, I would call it just hackery. Um, um, so, so, for example, when when um, Trump, when he is, I don't I don't know that it's it's quite right to call him a liar, even though the Washington Post basically turned it, calling him a liar into an industry <laughs> over the last year. Um, because a liar is someone who says something deliberately trying to <clears throat> mislead you and hoping that you won't figure out the truth. Whereas I just don't think he cared. At the same time, I think that he actually thought that his initial response about the, you know, the Muslims on the roofs in New Jersey, I think that he thought that was true when he said it. And once he thinks a thing is the case, then he's not ever going to doubt it. And he doesn't really care if you go and find that there's no proof of it. Um, 
So I don't know if that's lying exactly. It's not certainly not lying in the traditional sense of trying to mislead. Um, but I will say this also for for Trump. Um, when many many politicians, when they um, are challenged on on a on a on a flip flop or on a, a change of position, they will um, go back to previous positions that they now contradict, and they will try to rhetorically fit what I'm saying now with what I used to say. So if you completely switched your position on abortion, then you will say, um, from, from day one, which any time a politician starts a sentence with from day one, <laughs> you're about to hear a dishonesty. From day one, I have advocated the um, health of women or whatever. And so it's like this, um, it's all, you know, I said this then, but it's all the same thing because it comes from the same principle or whatever. Um, whereas when Trump, very early in the primary, he was asked about, um, his completely different position on on abortion because you can't run for president as a Republican unless you're um, pro-life, um, and um, he said something that I don't know that I've heard any politician at that level say in years and years and years, which was I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you don't change your mind in politics. Are you kidding? Um, and he's, he went on to say that, you know, he had, he was pro-abortion, but he had some friends who were going to have an abortion, and they didn't. And the kid grew up, and he's a tremendous kid. And, um, and so he had changed his mind. And so, I, you know, I thought at the time, well, that's kind of refreshing. Um, he, so he does have a, a weird relationship with the truth, for sure. But it's not the usual relationship of trying to um, <coughs> stitch up your past and to make it look like something that it's not. Instead, it's just sort of, um, um, sometimes I change my mind, sometimes I say things that are flatly untrue, but I don't really care. You can go and look it up if you want to and have your own opinion. Um, I'm not sure which is worse. Um, I, I do think that we've all, a lot of us have grown tired of the traditional way of handling contradiction and, and dishonesty and to hear somebody say I changed my mind is is um, very refreshing so I just I, I, meant, I want to ask a question but uh, I do want to remind you that it was the expert John Keynes who when the newspaper reporter found that it said one thing a few years ago and another thing now he said well the facts changed I, I changed my mind what would you do <laughs> so, uh, even experts can be allowed to do that, perhaps. If only uh, they would. But the point I wanted to make was, notice that he is not appointing anybody to his government. He's, he's appointed secretaries to head the departments, but he hasn't appointed deputies, undersecretaries, deputy undersecretaries, assistant secretaries. They're all sitting there vacant, and it's not because the Senate won't confirm them, it's because he's not nominating anybody. He's got... There, there are 4,000 patronage positions in the government, and every expert in politics would tell you this is valuable patronage. You get your all your supporters, nice jobs in the government. He's defying a basic principle of American politics uh, by... Now, have, has anybody commented on that? Has anybody noticed that that's happening? I don't know. Does this fit with his are these Is it because he doesn't want them? He doesn't want experts? He doesn't want people in the government mm. telling him what to do? He doesn't know they're not there yet. <laughs> so it's incompetence. It's incompetence. Yeah. He's, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm told that he, he doesn't like to, uh, well, I, I, been told of a couple of instances, and I think um, Elliot Abrams was a very high-level instance where 
someone was appointed and then it was discovered or brought to his attention that this person had said something bad about him in the in the past and so it's nixed. Maybe it's really, really hard to find people who haven't said bad things about Trump. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that there's some deliberate reason for it, though. That would be sort of interesting. You identified um, this tendency of politicians to generalize um, kind of their principles in order to seem like they're not changing their minds. Why don't they just admit that they're representatives of the people, that the people's opinions have shifted and they, acting as the people's representatives, are now shifting their opinions with them? Right. Why, don't they, why do they want to seem principled and not really like what they very much yeah. kind of are? Well, yeah. Because you want you want to seem you want to seem like you're leading even though you're following, <laughs> um, and it's weird. I mean, to for a politician to re reflect the views of the people is is an instance of following, um, and so sometimes when it's to their advantage, they'll say, "I'm just saying what the people say." Well, the people the people of Minnesota are very concerned about whatever issue. You know, they don't give a damn about the people what the people of Minnesota think. Um, and they haven't even talked to the people in Minnesota because they've been in Washington the whole time. Um, but they're, so when it's to their advantage, they'll sort of rhetorically allude to, well, I'm just reflecting the will of the people. But you can't do that too much or you seem like a follower. Um, and they're going to do what they want in any case. I mean, I've noticed o over the years, and my boss used to do this, um, they'll, they'll say, um, as, I, as I travel this country, Anytime a politician says, as I travel this country, or as, as I go up and down this state, um, <laughs> you're about to hear some total BS. Um, we, although it might, in some cases, be true, but um, as, as, as I travel this country, I, the politician, the people I talk to are the people that make their way to me and tell me how great I am. And so they're just reinforcing what I was going to say anyway. It's not like somebody buttonholed me at a fundraiser and, and you know, gave me their policy viewpoint. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. And I'm going to go say this on the floor of the Senate or whatever. Um, you know, they're going to do what they want to do. And sometimes rhetorically it's cast in the form of leading and sometimes in the form of following. But it's basically they want to be seen as leaders. I mean, that's the last question. I don't know. So after two hours, um, what I'm s s realizing, I have no clue of what experts are because we are really mostly talking about so-called experts or self-proclaimed experts. Or Russ was calling the neo-liberals experts. Um, you know, but there are other schools, obviously in economics, um, the neoconservatives experts, but there are very different schools of thought there. Um, so there, what's the if you've thought about this a lot, what's your definition of truly, who would truly be an expert? And that would, it would seem, you know, there is of course a knowledge that people have, say about, you know, Iraq or the Middle East. You need to know a lot of things. You need to know the language, you need to know the history, you need to know the politics, you need to, all these things are, are, are things that are very valuable. And those people who can, who know the lay of the land could, you know, with good right. reasons be called experts whom Harvey mentioned, the people that Andrew Ferguson um, calls out, the, the social scientists, uh, those are so-called experts. These studies can be easily shown to just be bunk. Yeah. So why are we confusing all the time experts, so-called experts, self-proclaimed experts, people who, you know, who have some knowledge but then mostly opinions about how things should be? Right. Do you have a real definition of actually what could happen? I don't know if I have a definition, but I do like the term specialist better. And I like the term intellectual, mm -hmm. um, which is a term Americans don't like because it sounds pretentious. But an intellectual is just somebody who's capable of taking big ideas and making them semi-plain to um, interested people. And a specialist would imply somebody with really narrow knowledge who you might tell, ask to do something and they could figure out how to do it. But the term expert seems to try to Com combine both of those, and so I just don't like it at all. You think Trump uh, is an intellectual? <laughs> 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 
you only have to stop and uh, I, we, what we've had in the last uh, uh, two hours, hour and a half is, is in the subtitle of your book, A Brief Education in Politics. So thanks very much. <laughs>